Chapter 6. A breathing exercise to control thoughts. The student who has completed the third stage of the meditation outlined in the foregoing chapter reveals thereby that he has set his hand to the plough with dogged patience and earnest endeavour. He has undertaken a task which calls for some of the best qualities in a man's character and for some of the most unused mental capacities. His effort is indeed praiseworthy because it has to be carried on alone in the solitude of his own room and he has none of the gregarious comfort which class study offers to the pupils of subjects other than self-knowledge. The line of reflection laid down for him in these pages is precisely that line which is best suited to solitary meditation. Were he fortunate enough to be in close association with an adept who could demonstrate in himself the rare attainment which he seeks, then indeed it is quite probable that the labour of such interrogative meditation would become far less for such a teacher intentionally kindles through mere personal contact alone the fire of spiritual experience in those who combine aspiration towards it with faith in him. Such a teacher will give more in a few minutes to a worthy pupil than the latter can gain by many months of solitary plodding. But a genuine adept is exceedingly hard to find in the modern world, though his feeble imitators are not lacking, and so these pages are penned to give a little help for the student who depends on self-effort alone. If he will read these pages with close, keen attention, heartfelt interest and a genuine desire to discover truth at the cost of parting with personal prejudices, if he will absorb their content in such a way that the mere perusal of the book provides him with an inner experience, then he will travel far and achieve an attractive spiritual reward for his trouble. If these pages are read in the right manner, with profound attention and deep feeling, then they may awaken secret forces which are latent in the being of a man, and then the reading will itself provide the student with a genuine spiritual experience. For it not only pictures a path to the divine self, but may enable the sincere student to travel along this path. The close of this third stage closes also the preparatory period of the student's inner journey. Hitherto, he has worked hard at his practices, but without much tangible reward. Henceforth, he will enter upon a course whereon he will gain new experiences, which will amply compensate him for every minute of effort, which, and which foreshadow the splendid goal that ultimately awaits him. All doubt will gradually begin to disappear, and uncertainty will gradually fall away from him who has found the right path to true self-knowledge. So far we have probed into the mysterious recesses of self. We have penetrated part of the way by the aid of the faculty of thought, but we cannot arrive at the quintessential nature of the self by its aid alone. We may now perceive how man is crushed against the barriers of mystery as soon as he begins to think really deeply. Where thinking cannot go, something else is to arise and lead us on. Rational thought provides us with a splendid instrument wherewith to comprehend life and the world up to a point, but it is a mistake to imagine that it is therefore the only instrument available to us. That new element is intuition, immediate understanding. When thinking fails, we may find this state of intuitive guardian, guidance by delicate and careful search. It is there within us, and it is open for all to discover. This is the meaning of Jesus' phrase, Search and ye shall find. Few ever take the trouble to search inwardly in this way, and therefore few find. How is the intuition to be awakened? When the reasoning, thinking, intellect subsides its activity, the intuition has a clear field in which to manifest itself. When the waves of thought no longer rise and fall upon the surface of the mind, the latter becomes like a calm, pellucid pool in which the sun of intuition can reflect itself without difficulty and without distortion. 
It is therefore necessary to find some means to reduce the constant agitation of the intellect. That can be done by a twofold process. The first consists of an effort to direct thoughts along a single channel of a certain kind, i.e. concentration upon an exalted abstract idea. If you have faithfully practiced the meditation exercise already given, or deliberately yielded yourself up to inspired works of art, then this part of the process will to some extent have inevitably been done, and intuitive minutes will be known. The second process entails the control of breathing. The reason is there exists a profound connection between breath and thought. The movements of breath beat time in a most remarkable fashion with the movements of thought. Breathing seems quite a simple act, and it may appear strange why it should have an, any effect upon mental action at all, but investigation and experiment indisputably prove the fact. Most people undervalue the powers of the breath, but the early Jesuits in the West and the early yogis in India knew better, for they embodied breathing exercises in their system of training. Those who have not studied the subject cannot realize what striking changes can be brought about in the body and in the mind through the simple means of changing the breath rhythm. A child understands that a breath quickly blown into hot milk will cool it, and that the same breath blown into cold hands will warm them. But we have to yet understand that breath can also be used to resist the diseases of the body, to endure the effects of extreme hot and cold, and to change the tone of one's thoughts. Consider for a moment that when you are excited, your breath comes in quick gasps, and when you are plunged in deep thought, it comes quietly and slowly. Watch a man who breathes in tumultuous jerks, and you will see that his nerves are equally restless. Does this not show how much friendship there is between breathing and the mind? Breathing is normally an unconscious function of life. Any attempt to change it will at once turn it into a conscious function. And so the student who wishes to affect his mentality through the breath must set aside brief periods when he deliberately alters its rhythm. If these periods are utilized in the manner to be described, carefully following the simple instructions which follow, the resultant effect will have upon his thoughts will be in time the most marked. But it is important that these instructions are not departed from or varied in any way. Here, a word of warning against the indiscriminate practice of published Indian yoga breathings is essential. With a teacher to guide and protect, the path of yoga breath control is rendered safe, but without one, it is a path of great danger. As an Indian yogi adept once told me while we sat together in a shady grove, the ancient masters who knew the different effects of different breathings tell us that through the breath we may make ourselves as powerful as gods equally as we may go down to insanity, incurable diseases and sudden death. You will then understand that where the rewards are so much greater, the dangers are no less great. In our system, there are exercises for different purposes, and if some are almost harmless, others, if wrongly done, are potent for grave injury. The breathing exercise which is given here, however, is a safe one and may be practiced without fear. It is the only yoga exercise of this kind which may safely be practiced without the supervision of a teacher, while it is so simple that no one can fail to do it rightly. But persons who suffer from heart disease should never practice any form of breathing exercise, whatever. The exercise consists in slowing down the rhythm of breathing to a point below the normal rate. The precise point cannot be prescribed here as it varies with different uh, persons, partly according to varying lung capacities and partly according to different degrees of nervous sensibility. The average healthy person breathes approximately 15 times each minute. Nevertheless, the full reduction should not be made straight away. It is always better to introduce such changes gradually and not violently. Begin by exhaling very slowly. Then inhale gently. Then hold the breath momentarily. Then breathe out again. 
Practice this with full attention and with eyes closed. It is important that the student should pour all his consciousness into his breathing until he seems to live in it for the time being. This exercise is to be practiced by beginners for five minutes, no longer. Advanced students may extend the time successively to 10, 15 and 20 minutes as they progress. None should go beyond the last time limit. A slow, regular and quiet effort alone is called for. There should be no straining and no violent deep breathing as that would defeat the student's aim. And complete muscular relaxation should reign. He may take it as a sign of success when the breath rhythm flows gently and effortlessly so that if a feather were held before the nostrils, it would not move. Yet if he feels the slightest discomfort or gasping for breath at any moment, he should stop at once and realize that he is practicing wrongly. Breathe through both nostrils. Any European or American student who practices the alternate nostril yoga breathing is taking great risks with his health and sanity. Leave it alone. Dilated lungs are the least danger. Such artificial and unnatural breathing exercises are usually practiced with a view to obtaining psychic powers. They have nothing in common with the natural control of breathing here advocated as a means of quietening the restless fever of thought and making the respiration as peaceful as that of a babe in the womb. This exercise is based on the simple fact that breathing in a medium between the mind and the body because it supplies arterialized blood to the brain. To diminish the cycle of breaths is to curtail the supply of blood to the brain and therefore to retard the cycle of thoughts. Breath is the horse and mind is the rider, say the Tibetans. Thus the tension and relaxation of the brain, the uprising and disappearance of thoughts, correspond in peculiar harmony with the cycle of breathing and can be brought under control. The effect upon the student is consciously dropping the rhythm of his breathing will be a pleasant, relaxed mood, a calming of the constant vibration of thought, a pouring of oil upon the troubled sea of life, and a more abstract mental condition. And in the intent concentration of his attention will cause him to forget other things in the act itself, so that he feels that he has become a breath being, as it were. He steeps himself utterly in the changed breathing process, blends his mind with it, submerges all other thoughts into watching it, and so becomes temporarily transformed into a subtler, more sensitive person. Such a stage is not reached immediately, but follows after weeks of regular practice. The power of this single exercise over the mind can scarcely be appreciated by those who have never practiced it. It restores a harmonious rhythm to the human machine. It can perform an agonized heart into a heart at peace with the world. Some years ago, a well-known Fleet Street journalist was unexpectedly promoted to the editorship of a famous London Sunday newspaper. He was Scotch and naturally ambitious, so he resolved to more than make good of his new post. He spared himself no effort, but drove himself like a slave driver to make a success of his editorship. He worked so hard, undertook so much responsibility, that a time came when outraged nature demanded her inexorable price. He collapsed and was carried away from his office and from his post a nervous wreck. For several months he lay in a seaside nursing home slowly rebuilding his shattered nerves and worn out body. But it was not until he was given this breathing exercise that he quickened his recovery and returned to Fleet Street. Not merely a well man, but a new man. For his entire outlook on life had changed through practicing this simple breathing exercise. Henceforth, he was able to see deeper into life, to grasp the spiritual purpose behind things, and to sense the divine harmony underneath all the discords of modern existence. This exercise may also be used at other times during the day quite apart from its present purpose. If at any time your self-control is threatened by violent passions or disturbing emotions or whatever kind, 
Immediately resort to this practice uh, of this breathing exercise until the danger has passed. Its effectiveness under such controls will be found quite remarkable. For the purpose of this self-inquiry, however, this breath control is only to be practiced by the student immediately after the meditation exercise has ended. He will have arrived at an apparent cul-de-sac in the final point of his meditation at what seems to be a mental blank wall. For having interrogated the body, the feelings and the intellect in their turn, he will have failed to find in each of them the elusive self which he seeks. He will be faced with nothingness for what exists in a man after these three have been eliminated. With that, he finishes his meditation, ends the racking of his brain by unfamiliar introspections and turns his mind to the above mentioned breath control exercise. When he succeeds with this practice, he will begin to gain a mental state in which thoughts lie stilled like charmed serpents. He will begin to gain the placidity of mind, which is one of the chief aims of Indian yoga, but he will obtain it without having to endure the strain, struggle and danger involved in the yoga breathing exercises, which unwise persons have indiscriminately made known to the West.